Hello and welcome to today's lesson on everyday forces and their effects. Our learning objectives are to apply Newton's three laws of motion and also to use vector diagrams to illustrate the resolution of forces, a net force, a resultant force, and equilibrium situations. To begin with, we're going to start with an experiment. All you need is two A4 sheets of paper, one of which you're going to crumple up into a ball and the other you're going to leave flat. Then you'll hold both above the ground at the same height and let go and see how long it takes both of them to hit the ground. Was there any difference? And if so, why do you think that was? Pause the video here while you go do that. When you initially drop the two pieces of paper, both of them have exactly the same weight and therefore exactly the same force acting on them and so will fall at the same rate with the same acceleration. However, as they start to speed up, the air resistance on the flat piece of paper is going to be much higher than the air resistance acting on the crumpled up piece of paper. As a result, the overall force on the flat piece of paper is much smaller the force on the crumpled up piece of paper is larger, so that will accelerate more, hitting the ground first. In a similar fashion, when a skydiver jumps out of an aeroplane, the only force acting on them is their own weight. As a result, they accelerate downwards very quickly. As they speed up, the force due to air resistance increases, and so the overall resultant force downwards will decrease. Eventually, the force due to air resistance equals the force due to the weight of the skydiver and the speed stops increasing. This is known as terminal velocity. At terminal velocity, the forces on the object are balanced and the overall velocity of the object remains constant. Terminal velocity is the velocity that an object achieves when the resultant force on that object is zero. Please pause the video now and copy down this definition for terminal velocity into your books. When the parachute is open, this increases the force due to air resistance significantly. The air resistance acting upwards becomes much larger than the force due to the weight of the falling object and therefore the overall resultant force is upwards. This upwards force causes the skydiver to slow down, which in turn reduces the air resistance until eventually the force due to air resistance is equal to the weight of the skydiver again. The skydiver again reaches terminal velocity, but this time the speed that they're falling at is significantly slower than it was previously. Here we have a speed time graph for a parachutist. I would like you to copy this graph into your books and then write down what is happening at each stage between point 1 to point 5. Pause the video while you do that. And you should have as your answer, point one was accelerating at its maximum rate. Point two, the rate of acceleration is reducing. Point three, it is traveling at constant velocity or terminal velocity. Point four, it is rapidly slowing down or decelerating. And point five, it is traveling at a constant lower velocity or terminal velocity again. I'd like you to now draw a free body diagram showing the forces acting on the skydiver it each of the five points on your graph. Once again, pause the video while you do that. You should initially have only the weight of the skydiver 
and then the weight of the skydiver remaining the same throughout obviously but the drag slowly increasing through two and three at four the drag increases significantly because the parachute is opening and then at five the skydiver has reached terminal velocity again but at a slow speed the question over objects in free fall actually goes back hundreds and hundreds of years uh, to the great thinker Aristotle and slightly more recently the father of physics himself Galileo. Aristotle believed that heavier objects must fall faster than lighter objects and for many hundreds of years people simply believed him. It was only when Galileo started conducting thought experiments that he was able to prove that the theory must be wrong. Galileo believed that all objects should fall at the same rate. It's been suggested that Galileo tested this idea by dropping lighter and heavier objects from the Leaning Tower of Pisa to see if they hit the ground at the same time. Whilst he's unlikely to have done this himself, the experiment has been repeated many times since. We now know that Galileo was indeed correct. If objects are falling, at least in a vacuum, they will fall at the same rate. And on Earth, this is the acceleration due to gravity, g, which near the Earth's surface is 10 meters per second squared. To see why this works, we use the equation f equals ma. This time we rearrange it to make acceleration the subject, so acceleration equals force divided by mass. And here you have two examples of objects, one an elephant and the other a cat. If both are dropped, they will fall with an acceleration dependent on their weight and their mass. Pause the video now while you calculate what that acceleration will be for the two objects. In both cases, you should find the acceleration equals 10 meters per second squared. This is the acceleration due to gravity, g. Obviously, over time, the speed of the object will increase and therefore air resistance will increase as well, reducing the overall acceleration. Now I'd like you to use Newton's second law to calculate the force acting on a car with a mass of 1,480 kilograms, accelerating at 1.6 meters per second squared. Don't forget to pause the video while you calculate it. And the answer would be 2,368 newtons. Remember, force would always be given in newtons. Next, what would the initial acceleration of a skydiver be if his mass was 74 kilograms, if he'd just stepped out of a plane? This was a bit of a trick question because the mass of the skydiver makes absolutely no difference because all objects will initially accelerate at 10 meters per second squared, the acceleration due to gravity, unless there is air resistance or some of the force acting on them. And now I'd like to find the acceleration of a steel ball bearing moving at terminal velocity in a tube of glycerin. Here the acceleration would be zero because the object is traveling at terminal velocity. Therefore, it's moving at a constant speed, so the speed isn't changing, there is no acceleration. The SSC Tuatar hypercar has a top speed of 316 miles per hour. But why do you think sports cars have a top speed? To help you understand this, I'd like you to draw a free body diagram of a car traveling at its top speed. You only need to include the horizontal forces acting on it. Pause the video now while you do that. You should have one force going forwards, either labelled thrust from the engine or force of the ground on the tyres, and then an equal and opposite force going backwards for air resistance and drag. Because there are two equal and opposite forces acting on the same object, the overall resultant force will be zero, and therefore there should be no acceleration, so this is the car at its maximum speed.
I'd like you now to copy and complete this paragraph using the words that are underneath. Don't forget to pause the video whilst you're working through it. And the answer is that as a car accelerates, there is a resultant force because the driving force, thrust, is greater than the air resistance, drag. As it continues to accelerate, drag increases, but thrust is still greater, so there's still a resultant force. The car accelerates at a slower rate. Eventually, the car produces its maximum thrust. Drag increases until the resultant force is zero. The car travels at a constant speed and can no longer accelerate. Right, well that brings us to the end of our lesson today. Thank you very much and I hope you found it useful.